year is 1996. After making two side-scrollers of a man named Duke Nukem, a third was made in a new first-person style inspired by its software's Doom. That game would become the most famous by far, the growing the beard moment as it were for the series. Or in this case, the donning the shades moment. Obviously, I'm referring to Duke Nukem 3D. It brought attitude, it brought style, it was the Duke that all future Duke games would seek to emulate, for better or worse. One such game is Duke Nukem Zero Hour for the Nintendo 64, and as of right now, it's coming into its 20th anniversary. The question is, can it live up to Duke Nukem 3D, or is it just a radioactive disaster? Now, Zero Hour wasn't the first Duke released on the N64. There was also a port slash remake of Duke 3D called Duke 64. Unlike that one, however, this one uses a different style and is an original game made for the system. One difference you'll notice right off the back is it's a third-person shooter, although there is a cheat code that technically makes it first-person. Lacking first-person models, though, it feels more like a rail shooter than a dedicated FPS, so I just go with third-person, but that's just me. Apart from that, though, the game is surprisingly faithful to the Duke 3D tone of things. Unlike Duke Nukem Time to Kill, which I honestly wasn't a very big fan of, Zero Hour places a heavy emphasis on action and a bit of exploration, including two secret levels. One departure from Duke 3D that I actually like is that rather than just being helpless women in pods that you can only mercy kill, you can actually save them. This is a carryover from Duke 64, and you can tell Zero Hour is actually based around it because there's more of an effort to place the women in secret locations to make it more rewarding to find them. Call me crazy, but Duke Nukem was based after action movies. It's far more satisfying to rescue hostages rather than just hear them begging for death. In addition to being a bragging right for finding all of them, saving one restores 10 of your health, which can be a big help if you're finding yourself short on it. Or you just look for a good old toilet or fire hydrant, both of which Duke is perfectly happy to drink from. Zero Hour actually has a much better drinking mechanic to 3Ds because you can actually mash the button to restore your health much faster. If you've ever seen 3Ds method, it's a bit on the slow side. Enemies have a decent amount of variety, starting with the usual lizards and pigs, but then getting a little more interesting. For instance, the pigs aren't limited to shotguns, but would have more arrow-appropriate things like rifles, and there's also some that sport grenade launchers, both frag and cyanide, and dynamite and bombs. Protozoid slimers have been replaced by creepy, crawly spiders, which pose a much greater threat than the former, which was more of a paper tiger than anything else. The spiders can legitimately drain your health pretty fast if you allow them, and there's even a big egg sack in places that can pump them out. There are also sentry guns, more mobile than their Duke 3D counterparts, and not only have rapid-fire versions, but counterparts that fire homing missiles at you. Thankfully, the latter is only found underwater, and only in a couple of levels. One neat trick is that you can just surface and the missiles will explode without hurting you. I guess Zero Hour follows the 3D functionality, where underwater is in a different physical location, so it treats explosions into your feet like they just no longer exist. Of course, there's also big stationary turrets, one that's fitted with a machine gun and missiles, and one that's much rarer and much deadlier, and it's armed with a BFG type of weapon. Beyond that, Octobrains have returned, and their brain pulse can now disorientate you, so do everything possible to avoid their fire, which thankfully isn't that hard. One enemy that's especially deadly is Sniper Lizards. They can take away huge chunks of your health at a time if you let them shoot you. Your one saving grace is that they have visible laser pointers that give a dead giveaway to their aim and position, so you can snipe them instead if you're fast enough. Zombies are also thrown into the mix. Thankfully, unlike Quake Zombies, they can be killed regularly, so you don't have to worry about them coming back to life. They just explode into gas, so either keep your distance or put on a mask. There's also cybernetic soldiers that attack you with energy weapons, and I found it's best to circle straight from around them as much as possible and unload with everything you've got. Of course, when they bend over and make a loud noise, you'd best back off because they're about to self-destruct. There's even a level late into the game with evil Duke clones. They're not to be taken lightly, unless, of course, you want to get lit by their gunfire. In addition to all that and a helicopter, you've even got a few bosses. You've got Boss Hog, a pretty funny hog on a tank with a cowboy hat that goes around in a circle and fires missiles at you. There's also a big friggin' robotic scorpion that fires lasers at you, and the final cycloid known as Zero that flies around and attacks you with various weapons. One boss of note is the Brainstorm, which isn't so much a traditional boss fight as its glass tank is basically unbreakable by mortal hands. Instead, you just go around and shut off its life support until it dies. Too bad killing Mother Brain in the Metroid games can't be that simple. As always, Duke Nukem's got plenty of weapons to fight them back with. You've got your fists, but if you're reduced to them, all I gotta say is good luck, buddy.
you've also got a pistol and in Rise of the Triad style, you can even double it up if you find another one. Then there's shotguns, rifles, including a sniper rifle, fully automatic weapons, explosives, trip mines, the works. Whatever combination of weapons you actually get depends on the era, like you get a very effective hunting rifle in the Wild West, but it lacks a scope. Of note is the Gamma Cannon, a rapid fire energy weapon whose projectiles bounce around a bit. There's also a freeze thrower, but unlike Duke 3D's version, it uses a spray, more like Forever's version. There's also a Volt Cannon, it's very effective and it's low in ammo consumption, but much like in Quake, discharging it underwater may cause a slight case of deadness. You can also get frag and cyanide grenade launchers like the pigs have, but the real prize is the BMF Thunderstrike. Obviously, it stands for the big mother- Shut your mouth! But I'm just talking about the Thunderstrike. As you may have guessed, it's inspired by the BFG and is useful for clearing out a room, but unlike the BFG, it uses its own ammo and it's quite rare, so be careful when you use it. Some usual items return, such as the portable med kit, stare- No! Unacceptable! I mean vitamin X. Acceptable! And automatic use scuba gear. One unique addition, as I mentioned before, is a gas mask you can use manually rather than automatically. The N64 controller isn't all the best to use in retrospect, but thankfully there's the magic of modern day emulators that you can use with a mouse and keyboard with, and when I played through it with that, I had a blast. The levels are varied enough too, so that it doesn't get too repetitive. You'll find yourself swimming through water, navigating through shootable vents, avoiding wily e. coyote style boulders trying to come down at you, riding minecarts, and the like. You even end up in a blimp at one point where it's period appropriate and that's being powered by hydrogen. In other words, when you make it to that part of the blimp, you'd best keep your weapons in your holster because even the slightest spark will kill you. I guess Duke swings his fists hard enough to make sparks because even that'll do it. One unique thing is that one of the secret levels is the Titanic and you have to purposefully sink the ship halfway through, after which you'll be racing back to the starting area as water floods the place. That's a great example of a backtrack level since it brings it to a different context where you're suddenly scrambling to remember which way is back. To put it simply, Duke Nukem Zero Hour does a fairly admirable job nailing a similar Duke 3D styled action but with exploration and there's enough variety of enemies, weapons, and environments that you'll never find yourself doing the same thing for too long. If you can get past the superficial camera perspective change, it's basically a Duke Nukem game through and through. As you should expect from a Duke Nukem game, especially a Duke Nukem game of this era, the plot isn't some overly deep philosophical quest of self-discovery. You'll have to see Zero Punctuation's fake review of Duke Nukem Forever if you want that. Basically, Duke's chilling in a military base when he's confronted by... himself. Yep, it's a time travel game, and this other self tells him he's stuck in the past and it's up to current Duke to save the world from the aliens. While you may think this is some different Duke, the game actually shows this from both sides, meaning this is technically the future Duke from the past, talking to past Duke from the present, warning him about the future, in the past. You probably don't want to think about that too hard. In any case, Duke is sent to the streets of New York, and then the Statue of Liberty. From there, when he's in the statue fighting aliens, a temporal disturbance breaks out, and you're suddenly in the apocalyptic future with a Planet of the Apes reference to the statue. Damn you. Damn you all. Eventually, Duke manages to get back to the Earth's military base, and after saving them from the aliens knocking at their door... Hurry, Duke! They're knocking at the front door! The female commander explains the situation. Turns out, and get this because it's gonna be a doozy, the aliens went into the past to try to change the future. Yeah, this shouldn't be a surprise to you since Duke already told us, but the good news is that they finally developed that time travel technology to send Duke back into the past, and then it starts in the Wild West. I need your clothes, your boots, and your horse. Uh, forget the horse. There, Duke learns of the aliens' plan to put a nuclear bomb into the core to blow up the Earth. Now, it doesn't really make much sense, since you'd think the Earth would already be blown up in the future, but I guess it caused the winter apocalypse or something, maybe they had time travel proof underpants on that day or something. In any case, Duke's arrested by a couple of female officers who thinks he's just a common bank robber and is thrown in prison with the usual loss of weapons until you get them back and reach a ship. There, you learn about the cybernetic soldiers and first have to face them and then make your way to the fort. One random fight with General Custer later. I say the only good Nukem is a dead Nukem. And Duke's in the mines to stop the bomb. Now your guess is as good as mine as to how Duke actually stops the bomb. He just reaches the bomb and then in the next level it's just there and diffused somehow. And then he has to fight a giant robo scorpion to get back through a time portal. After he gets back to the present, he's told by the commander that now the aliens are using a virus to bring about a zombie apocalypse. Sure, let's go with that. In any case, Duke is sent back to Victorian England, wherein the time machine is overloaded because of sending back too much of his equipment. Oops. Great. Stuck in the wussiest past they could think of. He now has to find a new one. 
The good news is he finds a new time machine almost immediately, but the bad news is it was booby-trapped, and he triggered the trap. Oops. As he fights through aliens and zombies and Jack the Ripper... <laughs> well, who better to rip a new one? He kills Brainstorm and makes it back to the present. All's well and good, right? Well, Duke had this other time machine set in overdrive, and now time and space is a bit twisted up. Oops. <laughs> Basically, you've got aliens from all time periods after you now, and you have to make your way to the mothership to end this madness once and for all. You know, it's a really good thing that time and space will just resolve itself somehow after you do. It's a plot point that isn't really brought up after this. Whatever, it's a classic Duke Nukem game, so you don't really have to think about it too much. Seriously, don't think about it too much. You just kill the Duke clones, bring down the mothership, and show Zero why he's the Zero and you're the hero, and you've saved the day. The game, interestingly enough, uses cutscenes and voice dialogue, but they never really overstay their welcome, at least not in my opinion. I mean, even Duke Nukem 3D had cutscenes. The aliens using zombies is definitely a new one. Prior to this, their only experimentation with humans was turning them into pit cops, but it kind of fits. I find it weird how there's no explanation for how Duke stopped the bomb and how time and space just suddenly fixed itself in the end, but eh. The plot is there, and it's enough to justify the set pieces, so it does the job it's supposed to do. Really, that's probably all you can ask for. Better that than for the plot to get unnecessarily weighted down with unnecessary fluff, and unlike forever in my opinion, this Duke is at least likable and down to business, so that's a plus. I've read somewhere that Zero Hour uses a modified build engine, and while I'm not sure how verifiable that is, it makes a lot of sense. Much of the game looks like it could have been done with the build engine due to being largely one floor and one ceiling at a time. Granted, it does also mix in polygonal pieces where appropriate, including polygonal models for all the actors, but even the original build engine had voxels, so polygons aren't that big of a stretch. One thing I've noticed about the game is that by the standards of the N64 at least, the environment textures are fairly sharp and detailed. While it's obviously far dated by now, it's hardly the blurry mud you typically associate with N64 games due to the relatively small texture cache mixed with a trilinear filter. The character models themselves have a sort of dollish feel to them in that their pieces jointed together. This isn't a bad thing, and it actually makes sense because polygonal limitations mean it'd be very hard to pull off deformation without it looking really bad, so having them look detached to the joints allows it to not look quite so jarring. There's a decent enough of environmental variety, and they seem to use different colors. For instance, the streets of LA are more grayish with vibrant neon lights, while the apocalyptic future heavily emphasizes blue to give it that chilling feeling, while Victorian England is lightly foggy. While Nintendo was still somewhat restricting what they could get away with, what they could get away with is a surprising amount. There are double entendres absolutely everywhere in this game, and one level even makes fun of Nintendo not allowing alcoholic references in Dry Town. The voice acting is fine, nothing groundbreaking, but it's serviceable. Obviously, John St. John steals the show there with his iconic portrayal of the Duke himself. The music is well fitting for what it is, and the Winter Apocalypse is fittingly devoid of the music a lot of time in favor of a soft ambience. Of course, everything is era appropriate too. For instance, the portable med kit looks exactly like it is in 3D, but in the Wild West of Victorian England, it's suddenly a doctor's bag. In the same token, the scuba gear is a diving helmet in the past eras. Along with that, the appearance of the enemies and the music is also tailored to the era, as well as it can be. All of the cutscenes are real-time, which is probably to be expected on the N64 with its small storage space compared to the PS1's discs, but the models are expressive enough that it really doesn't matter too much, and there's a healthy amount of voice acting. I find it interesting how in Duke 64 they had to remove music for the sake of the voice acting, but here they managed to have both voice lines and music at the same time. If I had to guess, it's because it's an original game, so they were able to optimize the soundtracks better. I think the game looks and sounds very reasonably well for its time when you consider the limitations they had to work with. The game technically uses an expansion pack, but the increase in screen resolution comes at the cost of frame rate, so if you're going to play this on physical hardware, you might not want to use it. As I said earlier though, emulation is always an option, and you can pump up the resolution up as high as you want, so it's a non-issue in this day and age. To put it simply, Zero Hour is a good-looking and pretty good-sounding game. While it's not exactly breaking the bank in terms of complexity, what it's got is well put together. It has a good amount of visual variety and plenty of cheesy one-liners to keep it interesting. Since the release of Duke 3D, it seems like all the other Duke games after that were trying to, in one form or another, recapture the magic that it managed to have. Zero Hour, in my humble little opinion, is definitely the better among them, and it comes the closest to capturing that old Duke magic. It's not perfect by any means, but it really manages to capture that heart and soul of Duke's personality. Perhaps the most impressive is how masterfully they managed to skirt around Nintendo's restrictions at the time to deliver an uncompromised experience. 
you ask me, Duke Nukem Zero Hour is the closest thing to a truly worthy successor to Duke 3D, and I highly recommend it for anyone who's a fan of that game. Preferably with an emulator, because it's 2019 and full HD with mouse and keyboard is the best. Thanks for watching this review, and I'll see you next time. In the words of Duke Nukem, Hail to the King, baby!